Be sure to check out my second channel called Rob Explains. There you can check out videos where I explain things outside of comic books. So what I want to do here is have a discussion on the idea of what it means when a mutant is referred to as beyond Omega level, as well as how this information translates to the character of Gabriel Summers and the steps that Marvel took to demonstrate him as being one of the most powerful characters in all of Marvel Comics. So in my video on mutant power classes, we had talked about how within the context of Marvel Comics, the X-Men, the various governments, and races of the Marvel Universe all structure the mutant hierarchy in terms of most powerful to least powerful. Near the top of the pantheon rests around nine individuals, all of which are considered to be the most formidable threats on Earth. Possessing abilities like element manipulation in the instance of Storm, or the power to control the genetic structure of others in the case of Elixir, these nine individuals represent mutants with powers that have no clear limit and no end to their potential. Beyond this rest characters who are referred to as existing beyond Omega level mutants. These five characters are individuals whose powers transcend measurement and allow them to control one or all aspects of reality itself, thereby removing them from the confines of earthbound threats and making them universal, or in the case of Mad Jim Jaspers, multi-universal threats. As an example, in Hickman's run of the Fantastic Four during his battle with the Mad Celestials from another reality, both the present and future version of Franklin Richards were described as beyond Omega level, meaning that his power placed him on par with the cosmic entities of not just his own universe, but any universe in the Marvel multiverse. In X-Men The 198, a companion comic focusing on the fallout of the House of M and the depowering of 98% of Earth's mutant population, a man named Absalon Mercator was revealed to exist beyond Omega level and had the power to manipulate matter on a subatomic scale, whether by direct or indirect contact. While these two individuals highlight the extreme power available to beyond Omega level mutants, Vulcan represents a more reasonable approach in that while he is beyond Omega level, this isn't necessarily due to his ability to skew reality so much as control over the fundamental energies that make up the universe. <laughs> So Vulcan makes his debut in the 2006 story Deadly Genesis, which served as a retcon taking place between the time that the original X-Men series ended and the time it was relaunched with Giant Size X-Men issue number one in 1975. With Giant Size X-Men, Marvel had established that the original five X-Men were taken by a living island called Krakoa and that their rescue required Xavier to create a new X-Men team consisting of Storm, Colossus, Wolverine, Nightcrawler, and others. What Ed Brubaker did with Deadly Genesis was introduce a story where the team that made up Giant Size X-Men issue number one was actually Xavier's second attempt to rescue the original X-Men, and that his first attempt came in the form of Gabriel, the third summer's brother, Darwin, a mutant who could adapt his body to any situation, Sway, a mutant who could control time within a short distance of her body, and Petra, a terrakinetic who had limited control over the ground by causing minor earthquakes and creating rock formations. Now as he's presented here, Vulcan's origin story comes directly out of the origin for Scott Summers and his brother Alex Summers. When Scott and Alex, along with their father Christopher and mother Catherine, encountered the Shi'ar Empire and Deccan, at the time, while Scott and Alex were sent to safety using a parachute, Catherine was two months pregnant with Gabriel. When she and Christopher were taken aboard Deccan's ship, while Christopher tried to fight back to free themselves, in the end, he was subdued, Catherine was killed, and Gabriel was taken from her womb, all while Christopher was made to watch. Now, where the history of Christopher saw him sent to a prison planet to work as a slave, the story of Gabriel saw him placed in a Shi'ar growth chamber, allowing him to age into a young man at an extremely fast pace. Following this, Gabriel's memories are given in bits and pieces since he doesn't remember everything about his past. As he tells us, after being artificially aged, Gabriel was sent to work as a servant for a wealthy family in the Shi'ar Empire. During his time there, he was befriended by an old woman named Di Andril, who gave Gabriel a book on ancient Roman mythology, which also includes the coming of Christianity and Roman society and by extension, the introduction of Gabriel as one of the archangels of God. In addition to this, at some point during his adolescence, presumably during his puberty, Gabriel's powers manifested, which normally happens during this time in a mutant's life. Unable to control it and with no one to teach him how to use his powers, Gabriel accidentally killed Diandril by disintegrating her. Now between the time of Diandril's death on the Shi'ar homeworld and Gabriel's recruitment by Xavier, not much is given. At some point, Gabriel revolted against the Shi'ar guards who had been keeping him as a slave for the wealthy family. Destroying them and fleeing the Shi'ar homeworld, Gabriel found himself in a sewer in New York City, 
presumably living with or near the Morlocks, and was rescued by Moore McTaggart, a friend of Charles Xavier and mutant researcher who had devoted time to adopting mutants and introducing them to the Xavier School. Wrapping back around to Gabriel's recruitment in an effort to save the five original X-Men, while the group was able to free Cyclops before they could reach any of the other X-Men, the island had begun to fight Gabriel and his team. During the conflict, Sway was ripped in half and Darwin, Gabriel, and Petra were completely annihilated by an energy attack from Krakoa. Now, where giant Size X-Men saw Cyclops return to Krakoa with Storm, Wolverine, and the rest, at the end of that story, Jean Grey had sent the island of Krakoa into space. What Ed Brubaker did was take this idea, incorporate it into Deadly Genesis, and tell us that while this happened, Gabriel Summers and Darwin remained trapped inside after Petra had used her dying act to create a cavern. During this time, Darwin used his ability to adapt to any situation and converted his body to pure energy. Because Vulcan had the power to absorb and manipulate energy, Darwin merged himself with Vulcan and in doing so, allowed the two of them to stay alive within the island as it floated in space. Now, where the story of Vulcan continues on in Deadly Genesis, for the purpose of our discussion regarding his powers, Deadly Genesis isn't wildly important, but there are a few things we need to cover from the story. The first is that with Deadly Genesis picking up as part of the fallout from the House of M, which saw the Scarlet Witch stripping the powers from 98% of the mutant population, with Xavier missing following the House of M and the X-Men unable to locate him, the control of the Xavier School rests under the authority of Emma Frost, a former member of the Hellfire Club turned hero and member of the X-Men. When Gabriel woke up and made his return to Earth, while Emma was using Cerebra to search the planet for Xavier by looking for his mutant signature, the computer detected Vulcan, which registered off the charts as a mutant that existed well beyond Omega level as it was described by Emma Frost. With Emma established as an Omega level telepath in Uncanny X-Men issue number 513, as the writer for Deadly Genesis, Ed Brubaker used this to establish how far above her Gabriel stood and that when she attempted to read him, her mind was completely overwhelmed and shut down. Now what I also want to touch on here is Vulcan and his dealing with Rachel Summers. As the daughter of Jean Grey and Scott Summers from the Days of Future Past story, Marvel rolled Rachel's character over into the main timeline explaining that when Kitty Pride had kept Days of Future Past from happening, that future became an alternate reality, something Rachel looked to escape from. Over the course of her publication history, she served alongside the X-Men, became a host for the Phoenix Force, and became part of the British superhero team Excalibur. But at the time of this story, she had rejoined the X-Men using the mantle of Marvel Girl out of respect for Jean Grey, who was now deceased. When Vulcan had shown up on Earth after his awakening, his goal was revenge against Xavier for the death of his teammates and sought to lure Xavier out by kidnapping Cyclops and Marvel Girl, believing that she was Jean Grey. While he quickly learned that this was actually Rachel, during the conflict, Vulcan demonstrated his abilities to control energy by shutting down the synapses in Rachel's brain and knocking her out in the process. Now, the reason why this is important and a huge display of power is because as a harbinger for the Phoenix Force and an Omega-level telepath, Marvel is once again establishing how powerful Vulcan is and that neither Emma nor Rachel were able to stand against him. Now, in terms of a full-on display of his power as well as a definitive answer to what it is that he can do, with Deadly Genesis serving as an introduction for Vulcan and a prelude to the War of Kings, the conclusion of Deadly Genesis saw Gabriel making amends with Xavier and Cyclops, but also saw him learning about his backstory and the death of Christopher and Catherine at the hands of the Shi'ar. Seeking to gain revenge, with Uncanny X-Men issue number 477, which covers the time that Vulcan left Earth and traveled to the Shi'ar, what we're told is that originally, Vulcan was not an Omega-level mutant. Instead, when the Scarlet Witch stripped 98% of mutants of their powers and woke Vulcan up, the energy also enhanced his powers, making him Omega level. Now, why it was that this happened is never truly explained, but I would surmise that this was Marvel simply providing us with an offhanded explanation of why Vulcan is an Omega level character, a sentiment this actually compounded on during the War of Kings event proper. With Vulcan learning that the Shi'ar Empire is now ruled by Dekin's sister Lalandra, Vulcan arrives at the Shi'ar homeworld and splits their society in half, causing a civil war between those who would rather live as one of Gabriel's subjects than die by his hand. At the same time that this was happening, Marvel was writing a story about the Inhumans who were looking to escape a life running from the Kree as they constantly attempted to use the Inhumans to their own ends. Attacking three Shi'ar warships and invading the Kree homeworld of Hala, Black Bolt took over the Kree Empire but was targeted by Vulcan due to his destruction of the Shi'ar warships being viewed as an act of war. With this declaration of war initiating the War of Kings event, and Guardians of the Galaxy issue number 14 which served as a tie-in and also saw the return of Adam Warlock, a messiah figure within the Marvel Universe not unlike Jesus, Vulcan was tracked down by Adam Warlock in an effort to end the war and return peace to the universe. 
While the battle between them was short-lived, Marvel effectively gives us a definitive explanation of how powerful Vulcan is when Adam Warlock states that he had to flee the battle due to the fact that Vulcan was one of the most powerful beings he had ever encountered, including the various cosmic entities. What Adam Warlock tells us is that within seconds of their encounter, Vulcan had consumed almost all of his energies and was actually feeding on the energy of the universe itself, and that in the end, the only thing he could do was run away. What this means is that while Vulcan does not possess the power to warp reality and fall short of characters like Franklin Richards, who could simply will him out of existence, in comparison to beings like Galactus and the Celestials, Vulcan stands as their equal and is able to rival and even possibly exceed them in power. With that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end. I hope it shines some light on how powerful Vulcan is and where he stands in the pantheon of the Marvel Universe, and I will catch you guys later. Peace.